Holmes. How are you, my friend? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for asking. Welcome to the Spots of Love podcast. Um, I just told you before we started recording, but I've been saying on previous episodes as well, it's a lot of fun um, to talk to Barney fans that I don't get a chance to usually talk to, but it's a little bit more fun for me uh, to talk to folks like yourselves who helped structure and uh, put on screen this show that we all grew up um, and enjoyed and loved for so many years. Uh, so it's truly an honor to be able to talk to you and just want to say thank you again for sitting down and allowing me to have this opportunity. Oh, the, the honor's mine, my, you know, my friend. Um, the way that we always get started here is I usually ask the same question for everybody. Um, and that's just, what was your introduction to Barney? How did you end up working on a TV show like Barney and Friends? Well, actually, I had, I had uh, been doing programming for children for a number of years before uh, Barney even came along. And <clears throat> at the time, uh, in, I guess it was probably about 1995, I believe, um, I was directing another PBS TV show called Wishbone. Oh, yeah. And uh, you remember that show with the little dog and everything? Yeah. Very cute show. And um, so the it turned out that the company that owned Barney also owned Wishbone. Mm -hmm. And uh, Barney had been, uh, prior to my involvement, had been directed by TV directors. Uh, they mm -hmm. all had television background. And the uh, what your viewers may not know is that there's a, a difference between how you direct movies and how you direct TV shows. Uh, sure. the stylistically, it's different. There's there's some differences in how you technically what you do. So um, Barney had been doing this three camera television style kind of show. And they really wanted to kind of uh, reinvent the wheel a little bit. They wanted to bring in someone who had done films. I'd done some movies. I directed some movies and done a lot of uh, shows like Wishbone is actually shot film style with a single camera instead yeah. of multiple cameras. And so they wanted to bring in someone who had that sensitivity. And so uh, I was approached by the guy that was the executive producer at the time, a guy named Jim Rally. And mm -hmm. Jim, I've known Jim for a long time. And he called me up and we had lunch and he said, would you be interested in directing Barney? And uh, Wishbone was winding down at the time. They were about to go on hiatus. And um, uh, I said, well, I'll be honest with you. I've never seen the show. Uh, my, my son was actually, he was at that age where he was too old. He had, he had just missed that Barney uh, mm -hmm. crowd. So um, he, Jim loaned me some episodes. I watched them. And I was just, I was blown away by... Uh, not just the the uh, the fun side of the show, but I love the message of the show. I love the fact that it had love and acceptance, and that everyone had value. And and you know, I hadn't seen that before in any children's show. Usually, you know, they're teaching, oh, here's how to do your numbers, or here's how to here's how sure. to recognize colors, and all these technical things. No one was talking about the human side of children. Mm -hmm. And uh, I loved that aspect of it. And so I called Jim. And I said, yeah, I'd love to do it. So they had me direct a home video. Um, I think it was counting or something like that. And um, I just hit off with everybody on the set and uh, kids in the crew. And uh, so then they asked me to come, to come back and start directing episodes. And, and so I spent the next 15 years uh, directing episodes and home videos both for them. Uh, and but uh, one thing that your audience may not know is that all the directors on the show were freelance. So yeah. while I was directing shows for Barney, I was also directing shows for Wishbone and Mary Lou Retton's Flip Flop Shop and uh, all these other TV shows, uh, Horseland for CBS. And so I was doing all this other stuff while I was doing Barney. So I would go, away, I would direct a show for Barney. And then I would go away for a couple of weeks and do things for other people. And, and then I would come back and direct another show. Uh, so it, it was a real, uh, a real joy to be able to, to step away from some of the other shows I was doing that weren't near as, that didn't have that long-term value that I felt like Barney had. Um, oh, shit. Yeah. So, yeah, it, that's how I got involved. That's awesome. Um, talking about Wishbone for a second. 
Um, that that was also one of my favorite shows um, on PBS. When I when I grew up in the I grew up in the nineties. I was born in ninety three, so I grew up when Barney was right before his prime, and you know PBS was becoming that PBS Kids block that they had through the nineties. Um, and that's all that we could afford for television. So I grew up on all of those PBS shows: Wishbone, Barney, um, Lamb Chop, Sesame Street, Mr. Rock, all of those shows. And that's the reason why I do Clubhouse now is because. I started to notice how there's a, such an absence of quality television where kids learn something by the end of it. It wasn't just let's have an adventure, but while we have these adventures, let's learn something and you take something important with you as you, when you leave. And so um, all of those shows helped shape my childhood, Barney more specifically, but all of those had a piece. When working on Wishbone, was it difficult um, working with on a show where there's an actual dog that's the main character that <laughs> yeah, fortunately, before I did Wishbone, I'd actually done several shows with various kinds of animals. Uh, oh, okay. uh, so I was familiar with how to with you know how to work with uh, how to mix the two of humans and animals on the same set, and be yeah. able to to do that in a timely manner. Because as you know, when you're directing, especially a television show, uh, yeah. time is your enemy. And sure. so if you have a dog that decides he just doesn't want to do something, <laughs> you're in trouble. So you have yeah. to have know some tricks of how to get around those kinds of things. So, yes, any dog show is a challenge. And the dog that, that starred in Wishbone, was a, his real name was Soccer. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, came with uh, – Soccer was not a particularly smart dog. I will just tell you that okay. up front. Uh, <laughs> I've worked with a lot smarter dogs over the years, uh, but the trainer was a woman named Jackie Captain, and Jackie had done White Fang for Disney. She had done a lot of really big shows with animals, and she was brilliant. She was really good at making that dog look smart. Yeah. Uh, and then we did a lot of tricks. What, one of the things that you may not realize is we did a thing uh, that I always called above the world and below the world. And mm -hmm would happen is if you had a dog like soccer uh, that, for example, that he was any noise, he was scared of his own shadow. Any noise oh, wow. would scare him and make him run away and run back to his kennel. And um, uh, he, he would not swim and he didn't want to get anywhere near the water. So he had all these phobias. And yes. so I did this thing called above the world and below the world. And what I would do is I would film um, the actor looking down at soccer with the right eye line and be playing his lines and yelling at soccer. You know, for example, I did Treasure Island was one of the episodes I directed. And so you have, you know, these gruff pirates yar, yar, and yelling at them. Well, if they did that with soccer, soccer would be in his kennel in five seconds. So <laughs> I would film them like this, looking down at soccer. And then I would send the actor away and I would put Jackie in the bottom part of their wardrobe. So it was like just their pants. Oh, sure. And I would shoot soccer, him looking up at the person. And then, so then Jackie would be talking to him and be real sweet and all that, and get him wow. to look smart and do his head motions. But you then you cut the two together and it looks, you know, that people at home, yeah. you as a viewer, you don't know that soccer wasn't there when we were shooting it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Um, that's one thing working on Clubhouse, I found, uh, you have to get really creative sometimes when you're, when you're shooting certain things. Um, and then it all comes, it does, sometimes it doesn't even make sense in a, in a sense, like when you're filming it, all these chopped pieces just doesn't seem right. But when you put them together, it looks seamless and no one, unless, unless you're there that day for that filming, have any idea, uh, the work that it takes to get such a simple kind of shot. Well, that's why oh. visitors on a set are always they, they they you know for the first five minutes they think it's fascinating then after that they think it's boring because you're breaking yeah. everything down into these bits and pieces that you're later going to edit together. For and sure. one of the one of the um, uh, assets that I brought to the table is I actually started as an editor, so okay. I knew yeah. what it took to cut <laughs> a scene together. And that way I didn't sure. overshoot a scene. So I shot things I wouldn't, that the editor wouldn't need later. But I also knew how, what to shoot to make sure that everything edited together and cut together and the eye line is correct and all those kind of things. Yeah, that's beautiful. That, and that does really, really help when you, when you have the, 
the experience or at least knowledge of different backgrounds other than the one that you're specifically there to do, it helps everybody on the team kind of work together a little bit more seamlessly and it's a little bit less stressful um, yeah. when you have that experience. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I always said that the, the, one of the reasons why I became a director is that uh, I, it, it was because I wasn't very good at any one of the things that I had to be able to do. I wasn't a great cinematographer. I wasn't a great actor, so I couldn't direct the actors. I wasn't a great uh, music guy. I wasn't any of those things that make up a good show, yeah. but I knew a little bit about all of it. And sure. because of that, I could manage the people who did have those skills and actually create a good show. Definitely. Um, when it comes to working on shows uh, with like live animals and that kind of thing, and then working on a show like Barney, was there any, um, those are like those, they're vastly different from each other, but they're also different from other shows. With Barney, you have these giant costumes that's running around. With a show with live animals, you have live animals that, that some of them like Wishbone, which is the main characters. Was there any commonalities between working on a show or a video with live animals and working on like the set with Barney and these costumes that you that you kind of t took from those experiences that kind of helped each other? Well, the only real similarity between the two was that um, uh, in 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 coordinating the children, uh, the actor child actors on the show, uh, that was an issue both with working with a dog and working mm -hmm. with costume characters with adults inside them. Um, mm -hmm. Because uh, in both instances, they had to, I had as, as a director, had to make allowances for uh, how the kids, how to keep the kids safe, for example, in the case of Barney. Because you got this monstrous, you know, seven foot yeah. something, 350 pound character who his only view of the world was like looking through a mail slot. So it, yeah. he could only see through his mouth. And so you then you've got these little four foot kids who are, right next to him and he's jumping up and doing 360 degree spins and he's dancing during the numbers. And those kids have, I told them when, when they first, first came on the show, the very first thing I told them is don't get killed. <laughs> and the point was they have to watch out for him because he can't yeah. watch, he doesn't, he can't see them. And they have to always do the same movement in the same place at the same time, every take, because for if sure. they don't, He's going to be doing it. And if they don't, they're going to get hurt. Yeah. So um, that's is one in terms of Barney, that was the issue. But the similarity there was that when we were doing uh, Wishbone, uh, the dog, the dog's going to do what the dog's going to do. And yeah. you can rehearse the dog. And Jackie was Jackie Captain. The trainer was very good at rehearsing the dog and teaching him to do the same thing every time. But invariably, he would surprise you. And For so sure. the kids who were there on the camera with him had to flex with that. And mm -hmm. so if he took off running over here, they had to stay with him. Yeah. And, um, you know, as I'd said earlier, the, you know, the, the thing that, that is the biggest challenge on doing uh, television shows, especially mm -hmm. TV shows that are going to play on a network and have a schedule that's planned way in advance. And so you have to meet that schedule um, is that time is your killer. And so when you have a certain amount of, of script pages, you have to shoot in a certain amount of hours, you've got to meet that deadline. And when you've got a dog that won't, who doesn't feel like doing what he's supposed to do that day, or you've got a kid that shows up on Barney sick, which happens, uh, you've got to be able to flex. Um, that is always a challenge. For sure. Um, let's talk a little bit. We'll get a little bit deeper into Barney in a second, but let's just talk first um, about why did you why did you get into directing? You kind of explained a little bit that you, you realized you weren't as good with some of the other things, so you kind of got into directing that way. Um, but the whole idea of working on film or television and that, that whole concept, what made you want to get involved that way? Well, I actually uh, started out, I went to college. My dad said he would pay for college if as long as I would do a pre-law degree and go into law school and become a lawyer. <laughs> and I did that one semester and I just yeah. could not do it. 
I just could not see myself being an attorney. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. And I had a friend who was in the film department at that school, at University of Texas in Austin, Texas. And he said, uh, I was complaining and he said, you know, you ought to come, you ought to become a film major because all we do is watch movies and I know you love my movies and I did I've grown up loving movies and TV shows I grew up on Disney I mean I loved all that stuff and so I thought sounds good to me so I I switched majors and uh, fortunately while I was um, uh, in school uh, PBS which in those days was called um, what was it called? Um, anyway, it wasn't called public PBS. It was called something else. But they were handing out grants to students like me to make movies. And so I would do these little student films under a grant from NET, National Educational Television. And so I, the weird thing is, before, years later, I would end up directing shows for PBS. I was doing it in college. <laughs> So when I came out of school, uh, and when you do things in college, uh, little projects in college, you know, little 16 millimeter shows, you uh, end up writing and directing and producing and editing and doing pretty much everything except acting in them. And yeah. so I came out of college with a show, with shows I could actually show to people and say, here's what I've done. And yeah. the one thing that was stood out to potential employers was I had edited them. And at that time, they made, they were making the switch from what were called upright moviola editing machines, which is what Hollywood used to edit movies on. It's these huge old machines. But they were going to flatbed editing machines. And I had actually edited on those machines in college. And all the guys who had been working in the real world had been working on the upright moviolas. Well, all the production companies were going to the flatbed machines, so they needed an editor who could edit on these flatbed machines. Yeah. That's how I got my first job, is I got a job as an editor, and I started in TV commercials and did that for three and a half years. And during that time, I was uh, uh, editing. When you do national commercials, big national commercials, with lots of money involved, Mm -hmm. um, the editor many times will go on location with the crew. So while you're shooting the commercial, you're editing at the same time. Yeah. So I would be editing with the client uh, while the director was out there directing the footage. And they'd be sending it in, processing it, pretty because it's all done on film. Everything was analog in those days. Nothing was digital. Yeah. And so I'd be editing. Well, one time the director got sick. And so the, the client told the producer, Fred knows as much about this show as, as the director did. So let Fred direct <laughs> on this day. So I, they let me direct that next day. And sure enough, they liked what I did. And so I started directing stuff and did commercials wow. for a while. And then while I was doing the commercials, um, I actually got to do a documentary for a company. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an oil company. And so uh, down in Peru. And so I got to do that. And uh, I met a guy who was doing TV documentaries and I have always loved to travel. Um, and so I, he said, you know, it's great. People pay you to travel around the world and, and shoot movies. So I did TV documentaries for a while and wow. traveled all over the world. And, and I have uh, been to Africa five times. I've uh, been to the end of this. I've been to Cape town, the Southern end of the African continent. I have, uh, I've shot, in uh, all over Central America, uh, Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador and Mexico, of course, and uh, I've shot in I've shot in India, I've shot in China. I mean, I've been there, done that. So anyway, I um, I was doing a documentary in um, on the on the Awas coast, the of uh, called the Miskito coast, at a place called Awas. Uh, in Honduras and picked up a strange disease. Um, wow. It was bronchial. And when I came back, I was so sick, they took me immediately to the emergency room. And they thought it was malaria and they couldn't figure out what it was. They started running tests. Turned out it wasn't malaria. They never could figure it out. But I was sick for wow. six months. And finally, it went away. <clears throat> uh, but my wife told me, she said, you need to do yeah. something else. And <laughs> You know, I've never seen a movie worth dying for. So yeah. <laughs> um, I 
started looking around for things I could do. And I'd always wanted to do um, dramas and TV shows and things like that. I wasn't, after doing commercials, I wasn't as interested in doing commercials anymore. I didn't like, I called it selling your soul for 60 seconds. Because okay. it's just, you know, it's, to me, it wasn't real creative. So yeah. I wanted to do bigger shows and I wanted to have a positive impact on people. <clears throat> and so I started writing and I started writing scripts and doing spec scripts and sending them out. And people would pay me to hire me to write a script. And so then they'd hire me to direct. And I'd literally taught myself how to direct. You know, wow. there's one who mentors you, at least in my experience, no one, no other director is going to mentor you to take his job. Right. So yeah. um, I just literally taught myself how to work with actors. Fortunately, I'd actually done some acting when I was in uh, high school and, and, and earlier in my life. And so I could communicate with actors, but I literally taught myself how to direct. I taught myself screen direction. I taught myself how to not cross the line, all those things you have to wow. learn to be a director and made mistakes, learned from the mistakes, got better. And um, over time I became a director people would call on to especially working with children because I always loved working with kids. For sure. That's awesome. That's exciting that we have that thing in common. Um, Cause like for my show, I had to teach myself all those things. I had to teach myself how to edit, how to promote it. I had no idea how to do a television show when I started. And I've said it before, like you look at a show like Barney and other children's shows and they look so simple that you underestimate how much work it takes to make that show look that simple. Um, and I did that when I first started, I, I thought like, well, how hard could it be? But when you get into it, and having to film it and get the right shots and work with kids and music and dancing and then edit it and all those things. It's a lot of work, but I had to teach myself and I still edit and put all the stuff out myself and direct and that kind of thing. But I had to teach myself how to do those things. Um, so it's cool to have that, that commonality with you. Um, where you yeah, just, I'll, okay. tell you what I, I'll tell you what I do. And I would encourage you to do the same uh -huh. is that once I uh, became established as a director, and I would see, I would be visiting. I always made a point when I would come on a set, I would introduce myself to everybody from the PAs to the grips to everybody and ask their name and get to be, know them. And I'd, one of the things I'd ask them is, what's your long-term goal? And um, I'd say, you know, because they'd say, oh, well, about nine times out of 10, they'd say, I want to be a director. I want to yeah. take your job. And um I was always say my point was always, <clears throat> there's plenty of work to go around. Um, no one's mentoring you. And so if you want to learn how to direct, uh, if at lunch, you know, you can't do it while I'm directing because we're having to move as fast as we can. Sure. But at lunch, if you want to sit down and ask me questions, I'll answer any question you have and awesome. I'll tell you how to do it and what to do and how to, yeah, and I'll even tell you what are the, roles, what are the easiest ways of breaking into directing? Because everybody seems to do it in a different way. But mm -hmm. there are things you can do to enhance your chances of, of becoming a director. So I would, yeah. I would try to mentor people and I would encourage you to do the same. For sure. That's awesome. Great advice. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, so let's jump back into Barney a little bit here. Uh, talking about you did all these films and things like that, along with television. Um, and joining Barney, they wanted someone who had kind of that film expertise and knowledge. Were you ever approached or did you ever want to uh, direct the the Great Adventure movie that they did? <laughs> no, I I was. Uh, uh, it's kind of a it's one of those weird political <laughs> things. Um, mm -hmm. The production company was a Hollywood production company and they Hollywood the people in Hollywood do not see anyone outside of Hollywood as being professional. Sure. And I have dealt in Hollywood. I've worked in Hollywood. I've worked in New York, worked in Chicago. I've worked in a bunch of environments outside of Texas. Mm -hmm. And um, there's this snobbish attitude about anyone who isn't living and working in LA. Sure. Um, and so the attitude of the production company is they wanted to use a Hollywood production, a director or someone who does Hollywood films. And the interesting thing is I directed three feature films, um, yeah. but because they saw me as a TV director, they weren't, uh, they wouldn't even consider having me direct it. Wow. 
such a shame too because that movie um it's it's an all right movie but it had the potential even from uh like the, the the original script and story with steve white to be something great that we sometimes wish that they would have went ahead and used the people who understood the character um to and it would have just made that movie even better um uh yeah i would, for, I would tell you yeah all the people who worked on the show that were from the show i mean worked on the movie who were from the show said it was not a good experience and yeah. it was all mainly because of the director and he was, you know, Steve White is a great writer and he's a great guy yeah. and he's very creative. Uh, and um, it just it was a bad mistake not to use people who actually had been doing the show to do the movie. But that was you, that all falls back to that production company. Yeah, just such a shame um, when it comes to filming the television show or um, maybe not even just the television show. You did home videos as well for Barney. What was it? What was it typically like to film? Um, let's let's use the episode. What was it like to film a typical episode um, for the TV series? Like, what would it, how would a day kind of be structured? Well, the, and it goes back. This refers back to your original point about no one understands how hard it is to make it look that simple. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a great point because I'll tell you. It's um, the process begins long before you walk out on the stage. Yeah. Um, and for example, as a freelance director, um, I would be hired to direct a certain amount of episodes for a season. So a typical season could be anywhere from 10 episodes to 22 or 23 episodes, depending on the year and what PBS asked for. Um, and so then the producers will hire us, the directors, and assign us the shows so that I know in advance uh, what times I'm going to be blocked out so I can then be doing other things. So they would then, when uh, one of my episodes would be coming up, they would then send me a early draft of the script and I would read it and send them my notes of things that I thought might help improvement. Being a writer, I, I was a asset in that department as well. I uh, ended up, in fact, they ended up being writing and directing uh, several episodes. I was the only uh, director who actually wrote and directed the same episodes. Right. Uh, but I, um, I would then send them my notes. And then as we got closer to the, the actual producing of the episode, uh, we would do production meeting. And we would come in and we'd bring all the department heads together in a giant room. And we would read through the latest draft of the script. And um, then I, as a director, would start telling people, I'd say, OK, uh, costume department, I'm going to need a Little Red Riding Hood wardrobe for, for yeah. Selena Gomez. Uh, or uh, uh, art department, uh, set design, I'm going to need you to build me a backdrop that looks like a forest. And, and I'd love to do this. And I'd work. They had a, a wonderful Catherine Yingling, who was a, a sketch artist. And she would do our um, uh, sketches of the sets and things like that. So I'd work with Catherine and we'd design the set. And so I could give that to the set department and they could start construction. And we had a big construction uh, area back behind the stages. So we would go through this production meeting. And then um, on the day before we started shooting, we would do a, a, uh, a reading through the script. And that would, that's the first time we'd bring the kids in and we'd sit around the table and we'd read through the old script and I would give them notes and I would uh, direct performance kind of things and, and then talk about what I'm going to be doing in terms of cameras and coverage and all that sort of thing. And then on the shoot week, um, actually, I take that back. The week prior to the shoot week, on that Friday, we would do a run through out on the stage. So okay. we bring everybody out. We would go through the show and talk it through, but it's a very rough run through. Sure. And then on Monday morning, we would bring everyone in and we would do a full run through and run it through multiple times until everybody knew their choreography and knew, made sure they knew their lines. And some were better at that. Then Selena Gomez was brilliant. She always knew her lines. So we'd run through it until everybody knew their stuff. Um, and all the blocking and everything. And then 
uh, the very last thing we would do on that day, on that Monday, is we would do a complete run through, just like a dress rehearsal on a stage play. So we'd yeah. run through the whole show from top to bottom. And we had a guy with a VHS video camera who would videotape the whole run through. And then okay. they would give me that VHS and I would go home that night and watch the VHS and take my script and block out every shot. So you're looking at a page of script and it has uh, baby bop says this line. And so I would put a line above baby bop's line and a script and draw a line below that. And over to the right margin, I would write BJ see you for close up shot one. And then I'd go to the next line. So Barney says a line. I'd draw lines uh, highlighting that thing. I would up to the side. I'd put a B for Barney and MS for medium shot. Shot two. I'd break down the entire script for the entire show. So wow. I would pre-edit in my head the entire show. Uh, so which means you had to know your cameras because we had four cameras. We had three on peds, on pedestals that would roll around. And then we had a cam eight, which is like a boom camera, like they use on MTV music videos. And it would do swinging shots and boom shots and all kinds of, so you have to know what your camera's capabilities are. And I would put in those shots. I'd say wow. camera four, our camera four was our uh, uh, boom camera or cam eight. And so I would tell Van, who was our cam eight operator, I'd say, okay, Van, I'm going to want you to start with a high wide shot looking down on the playground. And then as Barney comes down the steps of the caboose, I want you to sweep down to him in an MTV kind of move right up yeah. to a close up. And you would have to note all that on your script. For so sure. then on Tuesday morning, when you come in, the technical director and I show, uh, we start shooting at seven in the morning. We'd usually shoot from seven to seven, sometimes wow. longer. So I would show up around six or six thirty in the morning and my technical director would be there and my AD would be their assistant director. And so I would sit down with both these guys and the technical director is a guy that sits back in a booth and actually punches, punches the buttons that switches the cameras from camera to camera. And the AD is the guy who stands out on the set and coordinates and cameras and tells them what to do and everything. So I can sit back with the producer and watch the show being assembled live. Yeah. Um, and so I would meet with the two guys and I would give both of them my, my script and they would then take it and break it down into shot lists. So each of them had a shot list and wow. then the, the AD would go to the camera guys and he'd say on the back of their cameras, there'd be a little shot list for that scene. And it would say, you've got shot one and seven and eight and 10 so they'd know what shots they had. And they knew that with shot one was a close up of baby bop shot. 10 was a medium shot of somebody. But you, my point is they all had their shots. Mm -hmm. So then the, when we would start filming, we would always do, we'd ISO all of our cameras, all four cameras had their own recorders. So, oh, cool. we, so we would be, but I, we would live switch it. So the technical director using my script would call out the shots. And he'd say, okay, camera one, uh, shot one coming up. And so camera one knew exactly what shot one should look like. And then he would say, here, shot two, shot three. And we'd go through it and we'd shoot the scene. Then we would, uh, while we were shooting it, the producer and I would be watching it. And I'd say, you know, I had a medium shot for this line on Barney. I, you know, I'd really like to see his feet because well, he starts dancing. So I changed shot four to a shot of Barney's feet. So you could then adapt. And yeah. then Dave, you do like two or three passes. So you had all these choices and all of these are live switched from top yeah. to bottom. So then all that's given to an editor and the editor can look at my version of what I shot and approved and the producer approved, but they also had all the cameras ISOed. So yeah. because they were ISOed, they could go back to the original footage and they could pull other shots and drop them in if they, if they decided later in editing, they wanted to change something. Yeah. So, Anyway, make a long story short, and maybe a long, long story longer, uh, we would do uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and we would shoot the entire show in basically three days. Uh, wow. And that's a 30-minute you know, show in three days. That's 10 pages a day. That's, yeah. that's cooking it. And, uh, you know, on movies, when I do movies, uh, I would shoot sometimes 
uh, you know, four or five pages a day, and that was pushing it. But on yeah. TV, we would sometimes, based on, especially with home videos, when we're shooting so much stuff, Alan, we'd shoot sometimes 10, 15 pages a day. Wow. And that was killer. Yeah. I uh, became friends with a guy named Jerry Mullen years ago. And Jerry had won the Academy Award for producing Schindler's List. And he had oh. He produced a bunch of movies for Spielberg and all this stuff. And so he invited me one time to come visit while they were shooting Lost World on the Universal Backlot. Ooh. And so I was hanging out in the lot and I was watching this and, and watching Spielberg direct and talking to J my friend Jerry. And I said, well, you know, how much money are you spending on this? And he said, well, it's just north of $100 million. And I went, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> I said, how many pages do you shoot a day? And he said, oh, about a half page a day. <laughs> wow. I'm wow. shooting 15 pages a day on Barney and Spielberg's doing a half page a day. That's why it looks so good. Yeah. <laughs> That's such a big difference. Cause like with our show, we use a, um, we use a, a, a community studio. So it's uh, it's public access. So there's other shows that film there. So we can't leave our setup and things. So we, the way, when we moved from my basement, cause that's where I started into a studio, we had to build a set that was able to be taken apart each week and then put back together. Wow. Um, so when we do it, we only have two days a week and like five hours in the day. So we get our almost 30 minute episodes done in just two days. So it doesn't look as clean and as precise as it would if you had your own space and a little bit more time. But I can understand that like a 30 minute show and having just those three days to film that is pushing it. It's a it's such a stressful time when you just have two days to give all that you can. And if you don't, then that's it because someone else has to come in and film their show the next day after that. So, yeah. yeah so, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if you've got a $10,000 budget or a hundred million dollar budget, the yeah. process remains the same. Yeah, and it's sure. just really hard. Oh yeah, definitely. You have um, my respect, my friend. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned Selena Gomez earlier, and I feel like everyone talks about Selena Gomez and Demi Lovato um, as the child stars who made it big coming from Barney. Um, but there were a handful of others from that show as well, like Jaron Lewison, who played Joshua in the later seasons. Debbie Ryan, who was just there for one video, I think, or something like that. Um, Madison Pettis, that also kind of went on and became successful. You mentioned, I think, before in previous interviews, that you and kind of here you alluded to it with Selena Gomez that you kind of knew that they, that she would be a star just from how she was on that show at such a young age. Did you have the kind of that same feeling with some of those other kids who went on to be successful as well? In some cases, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's real interesting in that um, uh, you can tell some kids have the ability to become yeah. famous or stars or whatever you want to call them. Uh, mm -hmm. I just, I always call them just working professionals. Uh, sure. I'm a big fan of stars, but, yeah. uh, uh, but with, with Selena, for example, she just, there was just something about her that you could tell um, she had the ability to do it. It, mm -hmm. it was one, it went, number one, it was the intelligence. She's a very smart young lady. Um, sure. She always showed up prepared. Uh, she, if she was sick, she, you wouldn't know it because she, she gutted it up and she did the job. And we all were sick, sick at some point. When you do that much shows, you at some point you're all going to get sick. Um, mm -hmm. But she was, you could just tell. And that was true of, of a lot of the kids that I felt they had the ability to do it. But mm -hmm. what happens is there's this strange thing that happens for all of us. And that is that some people get the breaks and some people don't. Um, sure. With Selena, she was very fortunate. She got some good breaks, especially with Disney. Disney turned her into a star. And uh, uh, so she got the breaks and other kids. I've known other kids on the show uh, that was, that were just as talented and things just didn't work out for them for different yeah. reasons. Some, some cases there were, reasons that they're responsible for like they <clears throat> i know of kids that come to drugs and other kinds of problems sure. um but those kids who were disciplined and uh motivated and took a long-term view of their job uh those if they got the breaks 
would have an opportunity to have a career. For sure. Definitely. Um, when it comes to you, it, it's cool for you because you did so many episodes and home videos. You came in right after they finished with season three and uh, started doing the home videos. So you were able to be a part of, we call them generations as fans, first generation, <laughs> second, third, fourth, um, to based off the kids that were part of the, the show. And you were able to be, at, you came in right at the end of like the first generation going into the second and all the way through to the end. Um, so you're one of the few people who worked kind of with almost all of the kids, save for a few of them that, that came through. When it came to new kids working on the show, did you approach directing them differently than the seasoned kids who had been there for a little a, a little bit of time with you guys already? Or did you give them the same kind of directional treatment and this is what you have to be prepared for right from the beginning? Um I, yeah, you, you'd have to treat new kids different than than the seasoned kids uh, because the seasoned kids uh, knew the ropes. They knew how to protect, protect themselves so they didn't get stepped on by Barney. Uh, they, you know, they just knew what to do. And so I could be more relaxed with them. Um, yeah. Didn't have to be, as, didn't have to give them as much direction uh, because they knew what they were doing. They knew their characters. They knew the show. It was always a joy to work with the kids that had done a couple of seasons. And usually we didn't keep them much longer than two or three seasons because they're just, they would age out. And it was, oh, it was just killer when we lost a kid that had been with us. Emilio Mazur was one of our kids oh, yeah. that was with us for a long time. And I loved him. He was such a good kid. It was hard to find boys that would do the show. And yes. Uh, so he stayed with us, and when we he had to let him go, it was hard. Um, but with the new kids, uh, we did a thing called Barney Camp. Are you familiar with Barney Camp? I've heard of it, yes. Yeah, well, what happens when you bring a new kid on? One, when, when they go through this audition process to even get on the show. And the audition process, generally we bring them back two or three times, and we would, I would direct them during the audition to see if I could, if they would take direction. And... Sure. Um, I would give them things to do and challenge them and try to get them to show different kinds of emotions and so forth, just to make sure to see of their, their breadth of their ability. Sure. Um, and uh, so before they even showed up for Barney camp, uh, we had whittled them down to what we felt like were the best choices. Mm -hmm. And then we'd run them through Barney camp and Barney camp was a week long thing where the kids would come in and we would meet with them every day and we would take a script and we'd bring the, in some respects we, and sometimes we'd bring in the camera guys and we would pretend to shoot an episode so oh, they could you. see how it works and see all the different nuances of, of how things work. And so um, we would do all that. And by the end of that week, we had whittled them down to the cast kids for that season. Mm -hmm. um, and there were, uh, then when we come on the set, uh, even with new kids on the set, I would always give them a little more attention. I would remind them of issues. I would remind them and I'd say, okay, in this scene, uh, if you remember in the um, park set that we did that we were shooting in Carrollton, Texas, that had a caboose on it and it had front steps. I don't know if you've seen those episodes yes. or the later episodes, but um, Barney, uh, we had several times where Barney would come out the door of that caboose and go down those steps. Steps. Yeah. And the kids right behind him or right in front of him, which was really dangerous. Uh, usually I'd try to send them after him. But yeah. what happens is, as I mentioned earlier, the only thing he can see is like this. He, yeah. That's all he can see of the world. So he cannot see those steps. So when he's going down those steps, he's having to guess where they are. And yeah. he practiced it a lot until he knew, to, he just knew where those steps where were. Yeah. Yeah. But he's wearing these where my hand. He's wearing these monstrous feet. They're like uh -huh. snow skis. And he's bouncing down these steps and he's doing it real fast and staying in character. And yeah, I tell you how many times he missed missed a step. Oh, I believe it. Nose dived into the concrete. And so if that happened and the kids are around him, they could be seriously injured. And yeah. so I would, with the new kids, I would take them aside and I would talk them through what's happening. And I'd remind them over and over again, this is what's going to happen. This is where you're going to go. This is where you have to be at this point. 
And yeah. so then I would do, uh, I, I, back in my early days, I did a lot of uh, pyrotechnics. I do scenes with bombs exploding and, and yeah. actors running around mortar bombs and all this stuff and things. And so um, when you do those kind of scenes, you do, you go through them several times half speed and you walk them through slowly and you say, okay, you're going to be at this point, at this point, at, you're going to be here at this point in time and it's going to go boom right next to you. So then you're going to go to the next point. And at this point, you have to be at this spot because this mortar bomb is going to go bang over here yeah. because if you're standing on one of them, it'll take off your leg. Oh, so, yeah. uh, so I do the same thing with the kids with Barney come down those steps. I'd say, okay, I'm going to take you through half speed. We're going to make sure that you know, everybody knows where they're going to be when, and only then would we do a take. For sure. For sure. Um, yeah, that's awesome. That, that it's, I have some of those common things with, with the show also with um, not a huge costume kind of thing, but definitely when it came to getting new kids kind of in the, in the role and understanding where they have to hit and that kind of thing. So it's really, it's really interesting to hear how you guys had to do it. Cause yeah, a guy like, like Carrie or, or David Joyner or whoever else would have worn that suit at the time coming down the treehouse stairs or clubhouse or the uh, caboose stairs or whatever, they, they almost memorize where they are so they can almost blindly do it. But there are those moments where I, I imagine you miss those, those moments and you, you have nothing that you can do except for a fall. So making sure that those kids are out of the way is, is always right. interesting to hear how you guys got, got that be, to be able to be shot and have them be aware of that as well. Yeah, well, well, David and Carrie both, you know, they both did those 360s where they, yeah. I mean, those guys are strong and they could yeah. leap, leap up, lift, lift that entire costume off the ground and three, spin around 360 degrees of the land. Well, every time you do that, there's always the chance you're going to come down a little off kilter and you're going to go stumbling this direction. And if there's a kid standing there, it could be bad. And so yeah. one of the things we taught them in Barney camp was that you have to watch out for Barney. He cannot watch out for you. And so you have, you're your own best protection. And so they, if you, it, I can see it. I don't know if people watching the old episodes can see it, but when I watch those episodes, I can see the fear on some of their faces sometimes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> David would jump up and do one of his 360s and their little eyes are going, because <laughs> you know, yeah. they don't know where he's going to come down. And yeah. he doesn't know where he's going to come down. And you'll see them. We always told them there's no excuse for breaking character. You, if something's going wrong, you have to stay in character until you yeah. hear me say cut. And mm -hmm. so they would stay in character, but you could see them kind of edging. <laughs> you see them move, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, you, so we we already mentioned, and I I had this written down before you mentioned it earlier. But you you are the only one in the in the whole uh, run of that franchise who wrote and directed the same episodes. I think you did it six times in total. Um, but I, I think you're aware of it. Um, and us fans, we're always, I mean, I think we're, now that we're adults, we're kind of more crit critis critis um, critical about the show towards the end of the, the, the run of it. Um, but we know that things kind of got a little bit wonky towards the later seasons, but you wrote, I think arguably what is one of the best you wrote and directed, which is one of the best, I think, episodes that came from that we call it the riff era um which is little red rocking hood it's one of the it's one of the ones when we talk about those later shows and you know when they became more of that conflict based how um you know it didn't really work all the time but an episode like that was was beautifully done beautifully written and and uh filmed and all of that where did that idea for little red rocking hood come from because it's such a creative thing to take that a story that's well known put a new spin on it and it's music the entire time, which is what kids love so much about Barney to begin with. Um, how'd you come up with the idea for that, that specific episode? Do you remember it all? Oh, are you kidding? I, it's actually my favorite episode. Oh, um, really? Yeah. That's my favorite PBS episode. My favorite home video is land of make believe that we shot at oh, university okay. in yeah. Florida. And, uh, but uh, little red rocking hood uh, will always have a special place in my heart. It was, um, because it was totally my idea. I originated the idea and had to pitch it. And there was a lot of um, the people weren't real sure about doing it uh, yeah. because we were going to do something we hadn't done before. Um, and I called it a rock opera 
uh, I wanted to do a show that was where the whole story was told through music and yeah. it had never been done before and they were real hesitant about letting me do it. Um, uh, but uh, you're very kind. I'm glad you, you like it. It's uh, where it came from was frankly, we would do these <clears throat> uh, um, tests where we would bring in kids and uh, into and show them episodes and yeah. we would watch them while they watched the show. And so we would try to see where, um, uh, where they paid attention, where they started fidgeting, all those kind of things. And the thing that we noticed was the same thing you noticed, um, that, uh, that kids, when Barney was singing and the music was going on, they were really paying attention. Yeah. Um, and so I pitched them the idea of, um, I had actually directed some music videos. I did a music video with um, Johnny Cash. Got to work with Johnny oh, Cash. Wow. So, yeah, so I've done some new, and I and I love music. I love all kinds of music. Uh, to this day, I love all kinds of music. Um, and so I I thought, why not try mm -hmm. to do a show in which the whole thing is done um, like a rock opera, and yeah. so yeah. that. Uh, the point of the show is the difference between different kinds of music, country music and rock music, and that how really all music has value. And yeah. um, that uh, uh, and that I wanted to do it where instead of doing di long dialogue scenes, which kids get bored with, they yeah. sing the story. And so it's like an opera and everybody, instead of you know doing dialogue, you sing the dialogue. And so I got to work very closely with the composer and I actually uh, helped compose or create some of the songs because I actually play the guitar and I've played music. Oh, and um, so I would work with the composer. And so we would, I would say, here's the dialogue. Here's what I want to communicate. So how do we do this musically? And so it was an episode that was done totally different than anything yeah. been done. Uh, before and so when we started shooting everybody was going all the from the camera guys to the kids were going is this gonna work i mean i'm not sure i mean this seems really strange but it ended up working great so i'm yeah. very proud of it yeah you should be that one is is one of, i'm one of the guys i grew up like i said i was born in 93 so i watched barney all the way to the end i was in high school still watching it probably what i should have probably grown out of it but i didn't i still haven't um, and now I have kids who all they watch is my show and Barney all day long. So um, I saw from the, you know, the very beginning of Barney to all the way to the end. Um, and that is one of those greatest, one of the great episodes that came out of the entire series, but especially in those later seasons um, that really stands out. So you should definitely be proud of that work. Cause it's, I mean, it's, it just shows how talented you are both behind the camera um, but also from the writing standpoint and, and those kind of things. So I'm glad they allowed you to be able to take that leap and try something new um, and show that it, it worked. Uh, is there anything that you ever wanted to do um, with Barney that uh, didn't didn't get to go ahead? Like, is there any cool ideas or something that you had that they didn't necessarily approve to do? Uh, yes. Uh, humor. Uh, I love to laugh. I love, I wanted to get more humor, especially self-deprecating humor from Barney. Uh, I wanted to introduce more humor into the show. One of the things I love about Sesame Street is it doesn't take itself seriously. They don't yeah. mind having fun. They don't mind being silly and cookie monster. And they, I mean, I love that about the show and I wanted to see more of that. We would kind of do that a little bit on occasion, but I wanted to do whole episodes that were just funny and fun and silly and all that. Yeah. And it was, it, that was a, a nut we never cracked. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it could have, it would, I think it, it would have appealed to parents a little bit more. I know that there was never their, their intention to appeal to the parents. It was always about the kids. Um, but that's one thing that we found with clubhouse as well. That's kind of how I am too, where it's like, we, we're making it for the children. But we have in our show moments, especially this new season coming out, where we add a little bit more of my my comedy. Like, I love humor, too. So we add a little bit more of that to the show. And I think parents or even older kids appreciate a little bit more and can tolerate it um, if there's some things that they can pick up on or enjoy out of it 
uh, as well. So I wish, yeah, I, w I do wish that sometimes too, because you see Sesame Street show up on late night talk shows and things like that, and they just have fun. And, you know, I could see Barney and those guys or those dinosaurs in those kind of settings and just having fun, um, but it was something that they never had a chance to do. Yeah, it's uh, it's unfortunate. They, you know, they were scared that it would uh, hurt the dignity of Barney. Um, sure. But I think one of the reasons why the show uh, caught flack from a lot of older people <clears throat> is because it tried to take itself too seriously. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, anytime, anytime you uh, aren't able to laugh at yourself, someone's going to laugh at you. Oh, sure. Um, you know, if you remember the Inspector Clouseau a character from the Pink Panther movies, yeah, he was so great because he was a he was a bumbling fool. He took himself so seriously. He thought he was a brilliant detective, but yeah. you knew he was a bumbling fool. So you laugh at him. For uh, sure. The thing that we could have done with Barney is we could have had Barney um, having a sense of humor about himself, where he didn't take himself seriously, and where he could let his hair down and be silly and be fun and, um, and, and make mistakes and laugh about mistakes and all those things. And I think that's a good thing to teach kids, you know, it, that it's uh, one of life is hard. And one of the things that makes life easier is if you're able to laugh at the bad times and move on. For sure. Definitely. Um, I want to show you something I have. I'm kind of fortunate to have this. You you uh, directed the Barney and Outer Space movie uh -huh. um, way back when, and I was gifted this. It's a control panel piece from that. <laughs> That's I haven't seen that in probably 20 years. <laughs> you, how'd you get that? Um, well, you know Andrew Olson, I assume. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, sure. Helps run Barney history fans. He got his hands on some pieces from that set somehow, and he came up to visit. Uh, this summer when we were filming, and he brought that as a gift. So that's oh, one of my favorite movies, great. too, so I get to have that. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. I'll tell you, one of the fun things that we did in that show is that, you know, we had to have Barney. He's out in outer space, so it's zero gravity. He's got to float around. Well, we yeah. built this enormous rig on our, in front of a green screen, and mm -hmm. we lifted him up, and we twisted him around and flew him around. And I'll tell you, the poor guy, it, you know, that inside of that costume is very uncomfortable. It's full of yeah, yeah. all kinds of things. And so it was, but it turned out great. It was really a fun little episode. I'll That's show you something I, I have. Oh, yeah, go ahead. You, you, did you ever see one of the shows at the Radio City Music Hall? One yeah. Of the live shows? Mm -hmm. Well, this was one of the uh, 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 items or gifts that you got. I actually went to the show in New York wow. one time. And they handed these things out and it doesn't work anymore, but it used to light up and glow and sparkle and all this stuff. Yeah. And I'll tell you, one of my favorite memories, and this reason I love this is because one of my favorite memories is I was um, I was there. We were actually pitching doing another movie mm -hmm. and uh, to a production company there. And so um, that evening I went to the show and they put me on the front row so I could be close to watch the show. And it, we were doing the song, um, if every raindrop or lemon drops oh, and goes, yeah. oh, what a rain it will be. And at the point in that song where they go, eh, 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 eh. remember that point? When they yeah. do that, I turned around and looked back and the Radio City Music Hall is this monstrous uh, venue, holds yeah. 2,500 people. And there's 2,500 kids with their heads thrown back going, eh, eh, eh. It was wow. so cool. I yeah. loved it. Yeah. <laughs> That, that had to be something amazing to see. I never got a chance to see Barney live in person um, at all. Uh, so I'm always envious when, when people talk about the, the experience they had with it. But seeing so many kids just in sync with the music and enjoying it all at the same time, especially as someone who worked on the show, has to be has to be an amazing feeling to be able to witness and see that. Yeah, very rewarding to see the impact that it had on kids that kid kids knew every word of the songs they knew all the yeah. hand movements they knew everything uh, sure. so one other thing i've got is uh, you'd asked me to bring some things so yes we did a christmas show one time for barney and here's barney up oh, okay there, look there's his hat oh where am I? okay there we go <laughs> but here he is i've got this plush from that show um 
and we did this. We did the Christmas episode where you guys, is that the same? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that is so cool. I love the fact we got the same one. Yeah. <laughs> did that show. We, uh, we, I had done a, a TV movie mm -hmm. called Scrooge and Marley starred Dean Jones. I don't know if you remember yeah. him, but he did the love bug and all those movies for Disney. Yeah. And so I, um, I uh, did a, a TV movie with Dean uh, called Scrooge and Marley. It was a takeoff on a Christmas Carol, and we shot it Universal in New in L.A. And um, uh, when we did that, I, it, the show took place, and there was like these big snowy scenes and things. So I hired the guys who they were called Snow Business, and they were the same guys who created the snow for Gladiator that that movie, Ooh. the Gladiator. Movie. Yeah. Remember, remember that opening scene with the battle with the snow falling and stuff? Yeah. All, all that's fake. So I hired the same guys to do Scrooge and Marley for me. And one of the things they could do is not only do they cover everything with, with this fake snow, mm -hmm. uh, but they had, they've developed these machines mm -hmm. that are silent. So you can use them during dialogue and it wow. puts out this fake snow and it actually is like, it's made of like um, a, sort of a soap uh, oh, sure. Soap. So it floats like real snow, and when it lands on you, it melts like real snow. Oh. Isn't yeah. that cool? So in yeah. the old, when I first started out, the snow was made out of plastic, and you had to shake, you had a shaker box yeah. over your head that was shaking the snow <laughs> down, and they're covered in all this plastic. And if you're trying to sneeze, you're getting it in your mouth. This mm -hmm. stuff is biodegradable, it it's wow. not harms the environment, it melts on contact, and it looks just like real snow. So That's when we cool. did the, the Barney Christmas show, I, I hired the same guys and they came in with their machines. And so while we're doing these scenes out on stage A at Las Colinas, uh, no, this was actually in Carrollton. Mm -hmm. We had the whole place covered in snow and we had these guys blowing snow on top of the scene that was falling and snowing while we were singing. And what was really weird mm -hmm. is uh, when we would take a break, you could go out into the hallway outside of the stage and mm -hmm. it felt like it was 10 degrees warmer. And wow. it was no difference in temperature. It was purely psychological that when you Jeez. went inside with all the snow, you felt like it was colder. Isn't that weird? Yeah, that is weird. That's kind of cool. Um, before we wrap it up here, I have like two more questions for you. The, the item that you just showed, are those the, the items that you were bringing on to show? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, have a, I have a ton more, but most of it's in storage. I've got watches sure. and and coats and shirts and all hats yeah. and all these things that I've accumulated over the years from oh, Barney and, and all the shows I've done. So at some point, uh, my wife, when after I've gone, my wife will probably donate them to a museum somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's all good stuff to, to have uh, and, and keep hold of. And um, yeah, hopefully there is, there does become a time where we see Barney exhibits in a museum or something like they do much like Sesame street and those things. Cause he deserves that respect. I, I, I think, and he doesn't, he's one of those shows that was so, um, so, so great and so successful, but also a trailblazer for shows that came after. And he doesn't get as much of the love and respect from the general public as I think he, he deserves. Uh, so yeah, hopefully one day we get to see something like that. Um, real quick, I do want to get your take on this. I vow not to talk about this thing unless I'm on a podcast episode. Um, and so we know that next year is supposed to be this resurgence and this new version of um, what they're calling Bar like this Barney reboot. Do you have when when that uh, news dropped earlier this year? What was your what's your opinion on this new version that that Mattel is is working on putting out? Well, first and foremost, I I um, applaud the fact that someone is keeping the show alive. <clears throat> I. Um, I, I hope it's going to be good. I hope it's, um, it's, it honors the same things that we tried to accomplish that's respectful to sure, everyone sure. and kind and loving and uh, isn't critical. Um, you know, there's a difference between Barney um, being silly and making fun of himself and having someone else make fun of him. And yeah. I hope it's the former and not the latter. Um, and uh, so from that standpoint, I'm keeping an open mind. Uh, I, I don't like to judge things until I've seen it. Yes. Um, and even then, I mean, I prefer to just keep my mouth shut. If I don't like it, I'll just, it's their show. You know, Mattel owns it. They can do what they want with it. 
Um, uh, but I, for the kids' sake, I hope it's it it has some of the same qualities that the original show did. For sure. Um, my feeling and seeing the the new incarnation, uh, whether they do it animation or live action, that's their choice. Uh, I know animation is cheaper uh, yes. to do and, and less of a hassle to do. Uh, so I understand why they're doing it. Um, um, I, I love the fact that we had real kids interacting with a real character on the stage. I felt that brings same things to it than having a little animated kid responding to an animated dinosaur. It yeah. doesn't have that same uh, feeling. Mm -hmm. um, the when I saw the new in, incarnation of Barney, and where they took him from being a father figure down to just another kid, mm -hmm. uh, I felt like that is completely missing the point of the show. Yes. You know, Barney is is a beloved father figure. And if he's just another sidekick with the kids, uh, you know, he can't, he can't teach them anything. He can't yeah. uh, communicate values to them. He's just another kid. He shouldn't be any smarter than they are if you do it right. Um, so I think that's an error. Um, sure. And seeing the, the, the way they designed him with the little buck tooth thing. And yeah, I mean, it just makes you shake your head about, did anybody who did this, did they actually watch the show? Do they actually right. understand what made the show popular with kids? And mm -hmm. that's my fear. And But we'll see how it plays out. And I'll, I, I yeah. wish them the best. Yeah, that's kind of my gripe with it, too, is it's it, for all of you who worked on the show, especially in those very early years, um, the people who helped really establish what Barney looks like and who he is, it's almost it almost comes off as like a slap in the face to all of them because they worked so hard to perfect this design and this character and um, how he's portrayed. And then you could have brought Barney back animated and not at all change who he was or what he looked like and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. But I would view with the, I'm optimistic because I have young kids and they love the classic Barney. Um, and I'm hoping that it keeps those same core values that made Barney so popular. Um, I like the idea that new kids will have their version of Barney, but I'm just hoping he's the same kind of Barney that, um, whether he's animated or not, that that made Barney so popular to begin with. That's what I'm holding our optimism for. But yeah, I'm with you. I, I wait until I see something, not just a picture, but wait until I see something, you know, th that I can actually watch and and actually create some type of an opinion on before I actually set myself into a box without really knowing. So. Um, I'm right there with you. Um, Fred, thanks again for doing this this episode for me. Again, it's really been an honor. Um, the last question that I ask everyone before we end the podcast is just um, why Barney? Why do you think for you um, Barney was a show and a character that you decided to work on for so long? And why do you think he's as important as he is? Well, I, I went in every day trying to do my absolute best. And I did it for one reason only is because I uh, love kids. And um, as I mentioned earlier in, in our interview, I um, have done a lot of children's programming through the years and I love working with kids, but I also love creating something that future, future generations can grow up on and, and will have a positive impact on their lives. So uh, that's the reason why I did the show. It's why the reason I stayed with the show for 15 years is because it was doing that. And you just, uh, I, there are very few, especially when Barney started, there were very few shows doing that. There was Mr. Rogers, there was Sesame Street, and there was Barney. Uh, now there's 50 billion of them. But when it first started, there was hardly anyone doing it. And um, so it was a very unique opportunity to actually do something that met my life goal, and that is actually to um, leave a legacy of, of love and acceptance and a positive um, uh, take on the world behind. Um, that's what I want to, the message I want to leave to the next generation, to my grandchildren. I want them to all know that, you know, the world does ha it have its problems and there's issues and there's still prejudices and bigotry and all those terrible things. But um, 
you, the, you can't control that, but you can control yourself. And yes. so if you're a decent human being, you can help make your world a decent place. For sure. That's a perfect way to end it. I can't say it, I couldn't say it any better. So again, thank you, uh, Fred, for, for joining me on this podcast. I hope you had a good time. Um, oh, great time. I love to hear it. And uh, for the fans here, Barney History fans, I hope that you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. Um, again, the Google form exists now on our website, barneyhistoryfans.com. So if you want to be on the podcast, join that, find that Google form, put your name in. Um, and who knows, maybe one day we'll see you here in your spot of love. Take care, everybody. Mm-hmm.